test, does it work now? Or have they got to turn it on as well? Yeah, it's on. It's on? Yeah, you can hear your voice over. I can, I can? I can. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we've got a couple of really good talks just before lunch. Um, I've been looking forward to them for a long time. Um, the first of those talks that we're going to see today is Mike Davis, uh, who's a software engineer in test at Google. And he'll be talking to us about how you can use Selenium to um, help improve a team's development cycle, um, possibly by making them write tests. Yeah. You ready absolutely. for this, Mike? I'm ready. Hey! Thank you. So I'm Mike Davis, uh, as Simon said. I work for Google here in the London office. And I'm a tech lead for a small group of engineers who work with product teams to help them to, uh, to develop and to release better quality code faster. I've been at Google for about four years now, and in that time I've worked with six or seven different teams across ads, commerce, and mobile. Uh, and today I'd like to share a few of the ways in which we've used uh, tools like Selenium and WebDriver to help with this mission. In particular, how we've used these tools to improve a team's development cycle. So I guess I don't need to give you much background on Google and what we do. Obviously there's search, and then there's, like, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that as well. And it's a fairly diverse set of apps with some really interesting and unique testing problems. And importantly, I think, no matter what, you work, no matter what project you work on, uh, speed, scale, and quality is like absolutely everything. And that's not just building systems that deal with millions of users or serve billions of ad impressions. It's, it's also about engineering. So for example, if your team isn't pushing new releases and launching new features, at least weekly, then that's, that's a fairly serious sign that there's something wrong with your process. Uh, and before we go any further, I'd like to give you just a bit of a background on, on what I do. So my title is a Software Engineering Test, or SET. Uh, basically, it's everything and anything to improve quality and productivity of Google products. Uh, pretty much anything that isn't writing features, basically. That's a very broad definition. Uh, Simon Stewart here is, is also an SCT. So he builds and maintains WebDriver. In doing so, helps teams all over Google with their testing. And as such, is a very effective SCT. Other SCTs, like myself, work more closely with specific project teams, using our expertise in tools like WebDriver and Selenium to to help address project-specific pain points. So, for example, one day I could be helping teams to uh, uh, improve their compile times. The next, we could be building release infrastructure and trying to automate and speed up our releases. The next, we could be working on test automation, trying to find ways to catch more bugs sooner in the process and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a very varied role, specifically. It's, it's not strictly a QA org, so it's not just another name for QA engineer or for automation engineer. For example, I'm here to talk about how we, how we use Selenium and how we write Selenium tests, but I don't actually write a lot of Selenium tests myself, but we'll come on to that in a second. So the title was, How Can We Use Selenium to Improve a Team's Development Cycle? I think it's fairly obvious how we can use these tools to sort of improve the manual QA and to re relieve, relieve the burden and the sort of repetitiveness of manual QA, but how can we actually go about um, helping to improve a team's development cycle using these tools? So I put together these objectives. We hope to catch bugs before submission. So in my view, automated tests like this shouldn't be catching bugs in that we shouldn't be running these tests and then filing bugs because of failing test cases. We hope to catch these bugs before they get in. The, on the sort of flip side of that is that if we have these things, then the developers can use them as well. And they can use them to provide confidence that their changes haven't broken anything and that the system is always working. Um, and by doing this and catching bugs sooner in the process, we hope to reduce the amount of manual QA and reduce the number of bugs that we catch late on in our release cycles, uh, which should reduce the effort in our release, which should help us to release faster and more often. And also, we'd like to focus on using these tests for, uh, to catch bugs, and in particular, to, to focus on what these tests are really good at catching, uh, and catch the sort of bugs that are not likely to be caught anywhere else in the process. So our strategy for going about fulfilling this, tests are written at the same time as features. So ideally, we're going to say that a feature is complete only when it can be demonstrated to work with an uh, automated test. Uh, if we want to make sure that we catch bugs early, then we need to make sure that the tests are run before every check-in and that code that breaks a test is never submitted. Uh, and then we also want to run these, stages, these tests at all stages of the development process. So that is, we want, to, we want developers to be able to use them to test their uncommitted code. We want to be able to run them uh, to make sure that a project is not broken. And we also want to run them as part of our release. So some things that follow on from this. Um, we want to run them, like I said, we want to run them before. We want to run them sort of in pre-submits. We want to run them in continuous builds. We want to run them as uh, part of the release process. 
we really need to make sure, if we're going to invest the time in writing these things, we want to run them as much as possible. So I've worked in teams where we've taken Selenium tests from running once per release to once a day to once an hour, and right down to we run these before every single submit. Uh, and you can really see the, the value of these things increase as you move along there. Uh, I've yet to find a point where you could say the problem is that we're just running these tests too often. Um, but I haven't found that point yet. Maybe it exists, but we haven't found it. So also, the more we run these things, the more likely we are to, to start to detect like, flakinesses, both in the test and in the server under test. Um, and that allows us to go ahead and fix them and detect stuff we may not otherwise detect. We're even fortunate enough to have the ability to run these things a hundred or even a thousand times in parallel if we need to. And you can catch some really, really interesting bugs that way, both in uh, the test code, in the server code, and even in WebDriver itself. Um, and, yeah, so the next thing is that we really need to have developers involved. If we want, on every project I've worked on, we've been considerably outnumbered by developers. If we want to stick to our strategy of these things get written at the same time as features, even if I wanted to go about writing all these things, there's no way we could. So if we're going to keep with that strategy, then we need to get the developers involved in writing and maintaining these tests. So I spend a lot of my time working with developers, trying to get them enthusiastic about the prospect of writing these things, and pairing with them to help them with writing these things. So it's never an easy thing to do. I wish I could say I join a project, you stand up, give a 10-minute lecture on sort of TDD and uh, rapid releases and uh, early feedback, catching bugs soon, and they all sort of see the light and run off to go and write functional tests. Um, that doesn't normally happen. It's, it's hard work, but if you can, you need to find a good balance because it's really important. And yeah, the, the, where we are, the, this balance has to be that the developers are involved in writing and maintaining these things. So if the developers are writing and maintaining the things, then what do we as SETs contribute to this? Uh, and that's where the last point comes in. Our objective is to improve a team's cycle through this sort of testing. If we have bad tests, then not only are we going to sort of fail with this objective, we run the risk of actually doing the opposite and making productivity worse on the team through this strategy. So we really need to have good tests. Bad tests are going to consume a lot of everybody's time in debugging and maintaining them. Um, if we're going to stick by the strategy that you can't commit unless these are green, then it's going to start to hold up um, check-ins, which is going to delay features. People are going to start to lose faith in the tests and lose confidence in these tests, and this whole strategy is going to sort of start to fall flat. So what do we mean by really good tests? So when we write tests, these are the sorts of things that we, we look for in our tests. Um, when we make efforts to try to improve them, this is how we sort of measure our results. Our tests need to be fast and stable, need to be easy to run, easy to read, easy to debug, and easy to write. So obviously that's far easier said than done, right? Um, I don't think there's any silver bullets, but I put together a few of the things that we've done to try to, uh, to, try to address this and get our test closer to this end goal. Uh, and before we go any further, I'm calling these things functional tests, but whether we're talking about functional tests, integration tests, release tests, the key is that we're not talking about Selenium tests at this point. So it's really important to remember that Selenium is just a tool, right? It's just Selenium or WebDriver, just a browser automation tool. It's just one of the tools we're going to use as part of our test suite. A lot of the sort of biggest abuses I've seen from teams writing these sorts of things is where they start writing Selenium tests and they fall into the trap of um, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And before you know it, all their testing is done through driving a browser. Um, the, we're going to use Selenium and WebDriver as part of our functional testing, but these things are more than just Selenium tests. So the first thing we look for in good tests is these tests must run from a single command or from clicking a single button in your IDE. Um, we can't have any of this first install this software or you have to go add yourself to some Unix group or my favorite, which is you have to restart the browser, uh, you have to restart your computer, enter the BIOS, change a few settings and then run this script. We, we need to make these things really easy to run. Um, I joined a team and I said, how do you run your functional tests? And they said, oh, you just go to the wiki and follow these steps. Although good, uh, good documentation is good, it's no, it's no replacement for having tests that just run from a single command. If we want developers to write and maintain these things, we have to make it really easy for them or they're going to be fed up before they've even started. Um, next thing, if we want fast and stable tests, then we really need to have hermetic tests. By hermetic, we mean completely self-contained with no external dependencies. That means if we're going to be testing a server, then we're going to bring that server up under test and we're going to run it in memory. Um, that's never easy to do, but the difference it can make is um, phenomenal. So on my current project, we took a suite of tests from 15 minutes to 30 seconds just by changing it from running against servers running somewhere in the cloud to running it on servers that are brought up and running as part of the test. Um, and it also makes it a lot more stable. 
Obviously, any non-trivial server that you're going to be testing also has dependencies. Uh, my only advice is to, first of all, try running those as well. It's incredible how sort of, if you have a standard developer box these days, they're pretty beefy. It's amazing how much of a system stack you can actually bring up on a single machine. Uh, databases and data stores and such normally have pretty good in-memory implementations these days for this sort of testing. And if we really can't get this thing running as part of a single thing, then we should consider faking it out. Maybe, maybe you need to run tests against a real dependency to make sure that works, but more than likely, you only need one or two of these things. And if you've got a suite of 100 or 200 web driver tests, then we really shouldn't be dragging, dragging all these tests down with some slow, flaky, heavyweight dependency for the sake of those one or two tests. So we should really consider faking stuff out and writing fake implementations wherever we can. Um, uh, one cool thing we've done on a few Java projects is we've actually installed a custom security manager at the start of the test, which can block all non-loopback network traffic, which allows you to immediately detect as soon as this test tries to call outside of its local environment and cause it to fail with a like, nice error message. Uh, not only is that good for detecting external dependencies, but you can also use it to make sure they don't creep back in over time, so that once you've got a test which is completely hermetic and completely sealed, it doesn't suddenly start leaking external dependencies again. Um, the, if we want to keep these things fast, the next best way is to have less of them. Uh, the problem is that when you come to write these sorts of tests, it's always a lot easier, if in doubt, to go ahead and write it. If you, it takes a lot of sort of confidence and you have to really know what you're doing to say, I'm not going to write this test, we don't need it. Um, so it's really important that we try to limit these tests wherever we can. We need, to know, like, we need to know what is and isn't covered by our unit tests. And then also, if we're going to write a test and this could be covered by a smaller, more reliable, less flaky and far less resource intensive and easier to debug unit test, then we should just go ahead and write that unit test and we should really try to limit these things to only when you absolutely need to. Um, and then, although we need to limit the number, we're also going to try to keep them small. So if we want to test two paths to some application, then we're going to, we're going to make that two tests, right? If we want to have a positive and a negative flow through some, through some sequence, then we're going to make that two tests. If we're worried that's going to take longer, then the, we're going to make the tests independent because if they're going to be good tests, they're going to be independent anyway, and we can run them in parallel. Uh, an extreme example of this, I worked on a big Google front end, and we had... Um, Every test started by logging in, so it loads up the home page, clicks a sign in, redirects to a login server, username, password, hit the sign in button, redirect you back, and then the test itself starts. Like, if you have 200 tests, we're testing the sign in flow 200 times. If that takes like five seconds, then that's a huge amount of time wasted testing the same thing over and over again. So what we did was we pulled out one test, which tests the login flow, and for the other tests, we wrote some code that automatically generates an auth cookie and sets it in WebDriver with the sort of set cookie command. And then in all the other tests, we can just have a single thing which says navigate to the home page as a signed in user. Not only did it make the tests considerably faster, but it also made the test sort of simpler and easier to read because we now just navigate straight to where we want to be to run this test. Um, yeah, tests need to set up all the data. There's nothing worse than a test case that looks like this. This test logs in as test user one and asserts that they've got one purchase. Uh, to sort of emphasize this, I give you a couple of example exceptions. Expected one purchase, got two, and login failed. If you want to work out how that went wrong, I have no idea how this test even used to work, yet alone how it now suddenly doesn't work. My bet is that somebody's manually logged in as test user one and changed the password or added a second purchase and it's caused this test to fail. That's not a good reason for a test to fail. If this test needs a test user with one purchase, then this test should create a test user with one purchase. Um, also, people are, people are kind of reluctant to debug these things at the best of times. If we're going to encourage people to, to spend time debugging them, then we need to make it really easy for them. So a few, of the, a few things we've done to help with this. First of all, like we just saw, we need to make sure that all the information is in the source code. People don't like to like, start debugging something and discover it's because of something like someone's gone and logged in. Or if the tests aren't independent, you discover the last test passed, but it left the user in some funny state, and then this test failed. Like, that's not a good reason for a test to fail, and people aren't going to be encouraged to go and debug in the future when they see that sort of thing. Um, apart from that, we need to follow, obviously, the standard good practices when we write tests. We need to make sure false and 225 is not a good error message. We need to make sure we give useful error messages on our assertions. Uh, a slightly more interesting thing we did on one project, I added some code that when the, it detects it automatically when a test fails, and it uses WebDriver to grab a screenshot of exactly what the page looks like, then it uploads it to some server in the cloud and appends the URL of where that screenshot is direct into the exception message. So when this test fails, you now see it says timed out looking for element, and it gives you a screenshot 
right there in the error message. You don't have to go digging about for it. You can immediately see. Um, you can say, oh, I wonder why this is, and you're going to click that link. Um, that encourages people to go about starting debugging, and normally once someone's sort of started to dig in, they're going to spend some time and carry on looking at it. Um, yeah, going on from that, I see this quite a lot, where you have misleading error messages. So you see we have an exception here, timed out locating element. And if you look at what the, what the server actually looked like, we've got a 502 error. The problem with this is that somebody sees this, timed out locating the buy button, they're, they're immediately going to say, hmm, maybe we just need to wait longer. And they're going to bump the timeout and just retry the things. Like, you can bump the timeout as much as you like. That 502 page is never going to display a buy button. Uh, so here, what, what we've done is we've added some, we add some logic into WebDriver to automatically detect when we see these known bad error states, like 502 errors or we get the engineer has been called message show up. And we wrap the exception to give you something which is going to be more uh, easy to see what's going on and not to give you misleading error messages. And then one stage further from that again, when you see an error, for example this, the 502 error, more than likely whatever went wrong here didn't fail in the browser, right? You don't have JavaScript errors leading to a 502. Uh, whatever happened here happened on the server side. So like, if we really want to help people, then we added some code to the test and to our production server that enables you to go and pull back from the production server what error messages it's seen. So now we can, report, we can report that we detected the error page, and we can go to the server, and we can report what the error was on the server side. So now, if you, I mean, given this error message, there's really no excuse for going and having at least a little look to try and work out what's gone wrong here. Uh, so that's, what we, that's a few of the things that I consider um, important when we go for functional tests. So I thought we'd have a quick example. This is just a, some a test as an example test for some generic sort of commerce site. Um, notice how this test is really easy to read. It reads like a story, like we saw earlier. So you can see we create a user, we make a purchase for that user, we go to the home page, log in, hit the user dashboard, navigate to my orders, and we assert that the order that we created at the start of the test is present. Um, we have a very the careful use of API designs and abstractions uh, has made this test really easy to use. So we see all the things we saw in the previous talk, where we have page objects that abstract away all the details of... Um, notice you can't even tell if this test is Selenium or WebDriver. Um, which one it uses, it doesn't really matter. We've abstracted away all the details of that into page objects. And like we said earlier, we create all the data we need as part of the test. Um, this, is, this is... Also, there's a, very clean, there's a very clear and obvious architecture here. If we're going to get developers involved and we're going to have lots of people contributing, then if we don't have this sort of really obvious um, architecture, then people are going to start to get inventive. And before you know it, you end up with 20 different styles across all your tests. Um, so, yeah, I found people generally just tend to sort of copy and paste whatever they already find here in terms of styles. So if you can get the first couple right, then it makes a really big difference. I recently joined a project, and they had a set of tests which had pretty good infrastructure, but the, the actual architecture of the tests was a, like a, a real hodgepodge of some with page objects, some without, some that change from page objects to not halfway through the test. We did a few massive sort of cleanup refactoring CLs and made the test look more like this. And suddenly, even all the new tests were substantially better because what people were doing was they were just looking at what was there and just imitating it for their new tests. Uh, I thought we could have a quick counterexample as well. This, this is a page object. So the page object is supposed to be an abstraction around our... It's an abstraction around our interaction with the browser. It hides all the messy code that we need to interact with the browser and also the implementation details of what we see on the site. Um, only, first of all, if we look at the example on your left, it's a little leaky. So this page object returns web elements. Web element is WebDriver's representation of something on the page. As soon as we return web element, suddenly we're going to have test cases that are going to be doing things like calling get text, uh, and we're going to lose that really clean, fluent style that we saw in the previous example. Also, once we start to return these things, then we've lost our abstraction around the page. So if we change this page, then not only is this page, is this page object going to have to change, but we're more than likely going to have to go and update all the tests. It's a really good check to go through all, the, all your page objects and their public APIs and to make sure that they don't leak any uh, internal implementation details like this, because it's really easy to do. Um, the second thing is slightly more subtle. and I see this a lot when... When people, it's a sign that people don't have enough control over the environment under test. If we look at the get order function, then really this should be called get order and maybe create order, because what it's going to do is it's going to try to get an order, but if there, if there isn't an order, it's going to go ahead and create one. That might seem like it's really useful, it might seem like it helps, but 
it's normally a sign that there's something bad going on. I suspect what's happened is that all the tests are using the same user here. So depending on which order the tests run, either there is or isn't an order. And we've tried to hide that by injecting all this complexity into the page object. Whenever I see this, I tell people to sort of fix the underlying problem and go ahead and make the test create all the data like it should do. And it's incredible for stripping these things out and making them really simple. It, that you see on the left, how the, on the, my left, your right, how the, the page object has gone back to just having a single responsibility. It's no longer responsible for creating any data. And it makes it far simpler to read and far simpler to understand what's going on. So that's our, that's, that's a basic, um, hopefully we now have an idea about what, when I talk about good functional tests, this is the sort of thing we're looking for. I'd like to spend the rest of the time to quickly go through a few of the things that once we have good functional tests, what we can do to sort of go beyond and really get the most out of these tests. So at the start, we talked about having, having uh, we had an objective, which was to run these tests at all, uh, uh, everywhere in the release process. We want to run them as much as possible. So we wanted to run them at all stages of our development cycle. Since then, I've said that we need to make sure these things are really stable and fast, and we've run them against completely in-memory implementations. But when we come to release candidates, and we're, we're going to cut a release and push it out to production, then suddenly our, our priorities have changed. We no longer care whether it runs in memory. We have a server running in the cloud, and we want to know, does that server work? Can I push it to production? But also, we already have a really good suite of tests, right? So we don't want to go about rewriting them and having a second suite of tests, one for in memory and one for these um, servers running in the cloud. But if we cast our mind back to the example, how much of the test case was actually, actually related to the fact that we were running all these servers in memory and it was talking to a completely in memory environment? And because we've got some really nice abstractions and we've put everything into, we've abstracted all the details out, then actually only really the class that starts the server and maybe the classes that populate the data have any knowledge that they're running against an in-memory implementation. So one thing my team has done is we've, we've taken, we've, we've written the second implementation of all those pieces. And so you can take the same suite of tests and you can run them either against an in-memory environment as part of continuous builds and as part of um, pre-submit scripts. Or you can take the same suite of tests, inject in a different set of dependencies, and you can run them against your remote environment. Um, they'll be slower and they'll be slightly more flaky because they're now running against a remote environment, but they, they enable us to not have to write two sets of tests and to really get the most out of the tests. Uh, we also said we wanted to try to catch some of the sorts of bugs that manual QA was less likely to catch. Um, so one thing, an interesting thing I did on a project recently, um, just like everyone, I guess, we have a, we have a standard web app. Uh, it's going to communicate, so you're going to perform actions in the browser and it's going to communicate with the server by making AJAX calls. So we... We added some code to our tests and to the server, which enabled us to track exactly how many AJAX calls were made for each test, uh, which enabled us, and because we run it, we run our tests at every, single, at every single change to the project, then it enables us to do a nice graph like this. So this graph just shows an example test. This test just loads the home page, and you can see that the, the history of the project is on the bottom. So uh, head is going to be at the far, your far right of this graph. You can see that we have, so you can see here we make um, in a single run of this test, we make three calls to get home page data, two to get special offers, one to use the data, and as you might expect, when we load the home page, we never add anything to the basket. Um, what's really nice about this is it enables you to see some things really quickly. You can, it's really easy to see at what point we added special offers onto the home page. Like you see the graph jumps from zero to two. I would bet that change was what added special offers onto the home page. You can also spot that we've got a regression bug in get user data. At, at this change here, the number of calls jumps from one to two. If you've already got a fairly loaded server, then doubling the load on that call could well bring your whole production infrastructure to its knees. That sort of thing is not easy to detect when you're running manual tests, but with this sort of thing, it's really easy to see from this sort of graph. And because we've got really, because we've got really nice tests, then this sort of thing is really easy to do. Like when we added this, it's probably like an afternoon's worth of work to add this on top of a nice suite of tests. Uh, we've, this is just one example. We've also done other things, for example, um, I recently did some work at the end of every test. It automatically goes to the server and checks that, um, that we comply with all of Google's various logging policies and that all the server logs were good. We've, put, uh, we've experimented with putting security proxies between the browser and the server and injecting extra test cases that will fail if it detects any security vulnerabilities. We've also done stuff where you hook in listeners to WebDriver and then every time the page changes, 
you can take screenshots or you can run these tools that can detect layout bugs or by die errors and this sort of thing. But the key is that once we have a really good suite of tests, then adding in this sort of uh, adding in these extra things to get more value is really simple. Um, so that's what I had to talk about. Uh, we, our objective was to to try to catch bugs before submission, so we need to run these things as much as possible. We want to make sure that tests are written at the same time as features, and that we never that these tests never get broken. And for that, we need to get the devs involved. If we're going to get the devs involved, we need to make sure that we have really, really good tests. Um, but if we have really, really good tests, then there's loads of really cool ways that you can extend that. Uh, I don't know how long I've got for questions, but does anyone have any questions? Yep. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you profile your tests uh, and collect data. So I was a bit curious as whatever data that's been collected, is that plotted automatically or do you just collect that data and then plot it manually? Uh, so for the for these Yes, graphs, for this part, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so to, to do this, then we collect all the data as part of the test suite and we just... Um, we make sure that gets written to somewhere that we can then draw a graph from. So uh, we happen to have infrastructure that allows you to, uh, to do some of this stuff. But the key is that it basically writes into the test results. Where you have your test result file, then in the test result, we have a, um, like a profile of, uh, you have a profile of everything that was called, and then you can just iterate over that. So you can take, if you take every test result and you go through them, then you can easily draw a graph. Yep. The, um yeah, the, the reason for asking this was that uh, we have written something which actually automatically uh, not only just collect and dump this data, but also plot the graph uh, in your uh, continuous build server. Yeah. So with every build, in, uh, have that. but I yeah. think it's, it's a very good uh, yeah, statistics definitely. to collect. So, so we actually have this on a massive great monitor in front of the dev team along with a bunch of other metrics and it's a really good way, yeah, exactly. If you can, if you can hook it into your continuous build and you can get it running, exactly. there's a really good way to get people interested. The other thing about this that I forgot is that you can also take this data and you can aggregate it across your whole test suite. So like here, we don't see any calls to add to basket, which is what you would expect. If you have no tests that make a call to add to basket, then that's a fairly strong signal that your test suite is missing some sort of purchase flow test. So you can also use it to get a, to get a sort of minimum coverage metric, uh, which is something else we've been doing recently. Um, everyone who's leaving right now, the next presentation will start at 12.15 in Faraday. So if you're heading for that, then you can relax. You've got another five minutes. It's all good. Uh, if there's a sudden run for the toilets, I'm terribly sorry. Hi. Hi. I, I have a question around... Uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that you are grabbing server data. Could you give us some information on what kind of data you capture from the server logs and what triggers that capturing of data? So do you look for some specific exception? Do you monitor the server? For, for collecting stack traces? Yeah. So for that sort of thing, um, so what we do is, like in general for that sort of thing, I normally ask the question, what would we do in production? So if... Like, if you're seeing stack traces, then obviously, like, ideally you wouldn't, but, like, we're never going to catch all the bugs. So we, have, we must have some infrastructure that when we see these sorts of stack traces in production, that we can, like, we need, we need to have access to stack traces that we see for production. And then so what I did was I looked at, we looked at how we do it for production, and then I just hooked into that. So, um, yeah, in general, I think if you look at how, the, normally when it comes to the sorts of things you need for testing, I found that they're, they're normally very similar to what you need for sort of production monitoring, and where they're not, it's normally because people are missing production monitoring. So if you come about trying to write loads of stuff that enables you to get access to the exceptions via test, then either they probably already have something like that for doing production monitoring, or they probably need something like that for production monitoring, in which case you solve both problems. Sure. So do you leverage the uh, ops kind of tool set, or do you, I mean, what triggers that collection? Do you monitor at server level? With the, with the um, kind of tool in set? This, in this case, we were at the point where we see an error page, we would go and, we would go and get that data from the server. 
Um, so we added some logic that enabled us to work out which stack trace was going to be related to which error. Uh, the, other, the other way you can do it is to, is to have a sort of debug mode on your server that when it gives you a 502, it passes that exception. The easy way to do it is to, I've done it this way as well, which is when you get, a, when you get the exception, the server writes the exception onto the error page for, for test environments. That way, you, can, you don't need to go to the server at all. You can just read it off the page with WebDriver. And it also is particularly nice in, like, if you have a QA environment or something like that, you can also see the stack traces there without having to go into the server logs. It depends how much. Yeah, some teams really don't like doing that sort of thing. They don't like to have, like, a sort of these sorts of modes that could potentially lead into production. Unless anyone else has uh, asked. There's, sorry, one. Hello. Yeah. Could you speak a bit on uh, your success um, in involving the dev teams uh, use these test cases and write test cases? Yeah, so, so the, the key is that, um, so yeah, we have, so what we, what we need to do, like, so we try to make these tests really easy to write. So um, having these sorts of things. And then um, I think mainly what we do is like to start with, if we can pair with people, we, I normally try to write the first couple as examples so that they've got, like we saw with the, if you have one really good one, then people are going to copy that structure without getting too inventive then really it's just a question of spending time and sitting down with people to help them through them. Uh, and, and hopefully you can, get, you can get people to see the value of these things, that they want to write them rather than sort of being forced to write them. Um, yeah, I've worked on some projects where they already have this sort of thing. Like if you, uh, I found that some of the best developers, they, they sort of want to have these things already. I've joined projects where it's actually, it was really, really difficult to have any impact at all because their tests were already so good. Um, but... Yeah, in general, you just need to sit down with people and like help them, help them through the first few, and then they, they start to get better. Um, yeah, and just try to provide as much, make it as easy as possible. Like, um, yeah, I think that's what we've spent our time doing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I... Uh, sorry. Um, you mentioned that you have been grabbing screenshots for failures. So, um... In, in my experience, uh, it uh, just slowed down the process a bit. So did you experience any, uh, any shortcomings while collecting screenshots yeah. for failures? So, yeah, so that, so if you depend, yeah, so we, if you take screenshots, then it will slow the thing down a lot. So, so I certainly wouldn't do that. So because we run these tests at lots of stages, then I certainly wouldn't be turning that sort of thing on for continuous builds or for tests that are going to be run before submissions. But... Um, yeah, you can have, if you have those running sort of separately or in, in some non-critical path, then I guess you kind of have to accept the, the, if it's going to slow it down a lot, you have to kind of accept it. Or you pick specific test cases and rather than saying, because probably you don't need, maybe you don't need your whole suite at that point. So you can just pick a few test cases and add an annotation and just run some subset of your tests. It's one way we've come about doing that. If it gets, if it really gets too slow and you, um, you can't wait that long, then you can maybe consider running a subset. Uh, yeah, so that, that's what we've tried, or finding, um, or some of the things aren't as slow. Taking screenshots is slow, but maybe you can find um, other things, like some of the other things might not be that slow. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you use Selenium driver to test uh, Google Map as well? Do you, do you test Do you which, use sorry? Selenium driver to test Google Maps as well? With a Mac? It, map. Maps. Google Maps. Um, I believe they use they use either Selenium or WebDriver. I believe I'm not. Oh, I'm not sure. Sorry. I'm curious how you check the underlying um, map if it's been rendered or not. Uh, so Mike doesn't work on the maps yeah. projects, and so may not be the best person to answer that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, I know they have done some stuff. I've I've met a couple of the maps guys doing some interesting stuff with uh, Selenium and WebDriver, but I don't know the specifics. Sorry. Okay. Yep. So um, I think we should call a halt to the questions there. Mike is going to be around for a little bit longer today, so you can find him and chat to him and stuff like that. Um, but thank you very much, Mike. Thank you.